subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. It is Senior High School R uh, on Joy Learning Television. I'm thrilled to come your way again with another lesson in physics for Senior High School 2, SHS2. And then Kwabi Albert is my name, and you can always call me Pius. Today, we're going to look at a very interesting topic, that is energy. Something that you know all this while. Something that you have come across most of the time, in an, our everyday life, we exert energy. We use energy. So we start with the definition for energy. And energy is the ability or the capacity to do work. Energy is the ability or capacity, the ability to do work. So that means that whatever gives you some enablement, whatever is able to do some work, that should have energy. So just think around you. What helps you to do work? What helps you do something? What causes another thing to do some movement? Don't forget that work will only be done when a force causes a load to move through a distance in the direction of the force. So whatever will cause a movement of a load from one point to the other or through a distance in this direction, then work is done in that way. So whatever will give that enablement, that ability, we are saying it's energy. So for example, a coil spring can make the hands of a clock move. So because the coil spring can cause movement of the hand of the clock, then we say that energy is involved. Energy is involved. Now, most of the cars we have either run on diesel or petrol or these days we have electric cars. Now, if you have a car, you take it to the filling station and then you fill in the tank some petrol. The petrol burns in the engine of the car. That helps the pistons of the car's engine to move, which, at the long run, helps the car to move. So this particular petrol that burns to help the car to move has some energy, and it's giving that ability to do work. So energy is involved there. Now, a moving car can demolish a wall. So if accidentally a car runs into a wall, the world collapses. Energy is involved. Energy is exerted in that. So we are saying that energy is the ability to do work. Now, energy is a scalar quantity. Energy is a scalar quantity. That means that we can measure the energy, but we cannot tell the direction in which the energy is acting. Because scalar quantities have magnitude, they have value, but they do not have direction. So energy is a scalar quantity. And the unit of energy is the joule. So energy is measured in joule. So you can have maybe 10 joules of energy, 5 joules of energy, 1 joule of energy. So energy is measured in joules. Quick, let's look at what we call the sources. How, how do we get energy or where do we get energy from that becomes the sources of energy and at your level we are to discuss two main sources two main sources of energy the first is renewable sources of energy renewable it looks like a very big word we look at it renewable sources of energy and then we have non renewable sources of energy non renewable sources of energy so we are going to look at two main sources of energy let's read the first one renewable sources of energy when we say the energy sources or the energy source is renewable then we mean that 
these sources are replenished naturally. That means that as we use the, them naturally, they are replaced. They are replaced. They are replenished. And that happens over short periods of time. So because we use them and then nature replaces them over a short period of time, they do not get into extinction. That's what I mean by they do not deplete or they are not depleted with time. It can't happen that we wake up one day and we say, we have used all the energy of the sun, solar energy, the sun's rays coming to us. So we have now queue and get to maybe buy some solar energy. No. This energy source is being replaced naturally within short periods. So we can use the energy from the sun to do a lot of things and yet we will have more. So for renewable sources of energy, one, they are replenished, they are replaced naturally by nature within a short time. So they don't get finished good. They don't get depleted with time. Examples. So solar energy. The energy from, from the sun. Solar energy. Then wind energy. There's so much wind around. So much abundance of, of, of wind even at the seashore. So there's no way we would we lose that on that. Then hydro from water. From water. Then you have biomass. What's biomass? I believe you have come across biomass before. Biomass uh, talks about dead plants, dead animals, even waste from living organisms like uh, cow dung. All these materials put together becomes biomass. And then if we are able to take them through a process and they ferment, they are able to release or give off some gas, which you call the biogas. Biogas. So you have biomass, the materials, the dead, plants and animals, rotting, waste from living things, all of that, they come together as the biomass, the materials. Then as they ferment, they give off a gas, which you call the biogas. So biomass is also an example of a renewable source of energy. We can then look at the second source of energy, which is the non-renewable energy sources. So for these energy sources, they are in limited supply. You don't have so much of them. Therefore, with time, they get used up. They get depleted with time. So I'll give you an example pretty shortly. So as we keep using them, because naturally they are not replaced, and even if they have been replaced, the time within which they are replaced is so long that the human population is growing. Some people are using more than others, others are using. So with time, it gets depleted. It gets depleted. Now, I said that the rate of usage is higher than its formation. Very through. So we use, we use these energy sources more than they have been replaced or more than they have been formed so they get finished with time example coal coal or you look at petrol sometimes they say there's no petrol in town so drivers will have to go and queue both with their cars and gallons because they want enough so they fill their tanks of their cars and then they fill their gallons or other containers to store the petrol because there is shortage of petrol in town Sometimes kerosene, if you live in a community where you don't have access to electricity and you have to use maybe an oiliner or a lamping at night, you need kerosene to light it up. 
And sometimes they'll say, there is no kerosene in town. So you have to use the water you have judiciously until we are able to get more. These are non-renewable energy sources. So it tells you that as you use these energy, so energy or these energy sources, you have to be judicious in your usage. You have to use them wisely. You have to save them so that it will last long for us. Good. We can move ahead and look at forms of energy. Forms of energy. Mechanically, we can categorize, we can group all forms of energy as either kinetic, which is due to motion. So we can have the energy a body will possess by virtue of its motion. So because the body is in motion, the body is moving, it has a particular kind of energy. Or it will be potential. And this time it will be due to the position or the state where the body is found. So either kinetic or potential. So we're going to look at which of the forms of energy fall under kinetic and which of the forms of energy fall under potential. So this diagram is going to help us. So we have energy. I say that this energy, it can be either kinetic or it can be potential. Kinetic, energy of movement. Then potential, I talk about energy stored somewhere. So let's look at energy that comes as a result of movement. The first one I look at here is thermal energy. Thermal energy, you could also call it heat energy. Thermal energy. So try doing this. Just wrap your palms together for quite some time, let's say a minute or two. You realize that you start feeling like kind of heat in your palms because of the movement of your palms rubbing each other. There you have thermal energy, which I say we could call heat energy. So energy of moving particles. Then mechanical energy. Mechanical energy. Energy of objects in motion. Mechanical energy. And as we go along, you realize that mechanical energy comprises of both kinetic energy and potential energy. Then we look at how it's conserved. Then we have electrical energy. Electrical energy. Energy of particles moving through a wire. So if you are blessed to have electricity in your homes, the connections are done through wires. So some particles, some movement takes place through the wires and you get the electrical energy. Then we have magnetic energy. You know what magnets do? They either do attraction or they do repulsion. So energy causing a push or pull. A push, repel, a pull, attract. And that's magnetic energy. Magnetic energy. Then we can look at the forms that fall under potential energy by virtue of it being stored or its position. We are saying one is chemical energy. I'm sure you've eaten today. Take something in the morning, you take something in the afternoon, in the evening too. That energy you get from the food that you eat is chemical energy. And it's stored in your body. And that helps you to go about your everyday activities. So if you don't eat for a number of days, you don't become quite active because you are losing on some chemical energy. Then I've got elastic energy. Energy stored in objects that are stretched. So if you pick a rubber band and you stretch it, the energy stored in the rubber band is called elastic potential energy. Elastic potential energy. Good. So, energy stored in objects that are stretched. Then you have nuclear energy. 
energy stored in center of particles. So when you pick a nucleus of an atom, we are able to get some energy from there. We are saying it's nuclear energy. Then gravitational energy. Energy stored in an object when it is above the Earth's surface. So once you have to call gravitational force, that is in between bodies found within the Earth's surface, then we have gravitational energy. That energy is stored in objects above the Earth's surface. So by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to classify giving examples of forms of energy either as kinetic or potential. Kinetic or potential. Then there is energy that we ex experience in different ways, like sound energy. Right now, you can hear me speak. It is because of sound energy. I'm giving out some sound. Then, at night, you put on your lights. When your room is dark, you put on the lights. The bulb brightening up the place. You have light energy. And that helps our eyes to see. Good. Now, we have to look at something very important as far as energy is concerned. And as we call it, the greenhouse effect and global warming. Our world is changing. The world's population is increasing rapidly. They are not creating more lands. Naturally, all the lands we have, that's all we have. But the people who are occupying the land are increasing in numbers as the days go by. There are things that we do, activities that we do, that in effect makes life somehow uncomfortable for us. So as we go through this, you have to learn to help to save the planet so that life will be comfortable and bearable for us here by changing the way we do things. Now, most of the warmth we experience comes from solar radiation. So very often, early in the morning, you feel a little bit cold. But as the sun begins to rise, you feel some warmth from the rays of the sun. And that is what normally we get. But because the sun starts shining, and very often in the afternoons, it becomes so scorched, it becomes so hot, then it means that the earth would also have to radiate some of the heat coming from the sun into the atmosphere so that the surface of the earth will be cool to help us live comfortably. So ideally over time, the earth radiates the same amount of energy into space as it absorbs from the sun. That is an ideal situation. Ideally, when the sun gives us the rays and the heat, heat gets to us, then the earth would also have to radiate the heat away into space so that the environment will not be too hot or too warm for us to stay. But then, something happens. As the earth tries to radiate, give off the heat that comes to it from the sun, there are some gases that say, no way. We will not permit the heat that has come to the earth to move away into the atmosphere. And we call them greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases. So these greenhouse gases prevent the heat, the heat radiated from the earth, the infrared rays coming from the earth. The heat waves from the earth, they prevent them from escaping back into the atmosphere. So, they try to make the heat hover around, stay around the surface of the earth. Then we are in trouble because the surface of the earth will become warmer. Now, the activity of greenhouse gases trapping sound, the sun's rays from leaving the earth's surface is what we call the greenhouse effect the greenhouse effect so we have greenhouse gases and what they do is that they try to prevent heat 
or radiations from the earth from escaping into the atmosphere. That, uh, that act or that activity is called the greenhouse effect. So now you can be thinking about the, the consequence of this greenhouse effect on life on the earth. Good. So the activity of greenhouse gases keeps the earth warmer than it would be without these gases. So ideally, the sun's rays get to us, the earth radiates them back. But the greenhouse gases decide to keep the sun's rays that are being taken back, radiated back into the atmosphere. They decide to keep them on the surface of the earth. And so they make the earth warmer than it's supposed to be. Now, examples of greenhouse gases, you have carbon dioxide. And very soon I'll show you ways through which we produce carbon dioxide. So the more we produce carbon dioxide, <laughs> the more we try to trap heat rays to stay on the surface of the earth. And our lives will be uncomfortable by doing that. So we have carbon dioxide, we have methane, we have water vapor, that's what we call chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. Chlorofluorocarbons, they have to call nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide. So by the end of the lesson, you should be able to tell me some examples of greenhouse gases. So they are carbon dioxide or nitrous oxide, or you can say chlorofluorocarbons. You can say methane. So these are the gases that tend to prevent the heat that is moving away from the earth's surface from going into the atmosphere. They trap them and they cause them to stay closer to the surface of the earth. Now, it means that the more and more of these greenhouse gases we get in the atmosphere, the more they succeed in trapping heat from leaving the earth, then the warmer the earth will become. So the temperature of the earth's surface will rise. And this is called global warming. Global warming. So global warming is as a result of greenhouse gases trapping sun's rays from leaving the earth's surface thereby increasing or causing a rise in the temperature of the earth's surroundings and that makes life uncomfortable not just for only us as humans but even for other living organisms or living creatures so the honors lies on us it is our responsibility to do as much as we can to either reduce, if we can even prevent, we reduce the production of all these greenhouse gases so that we will have less heat on the surface or on the surroundings of the earth, then we will not be experiencing global warming. But if we don't do that, it means a time will come where we'll be forced to be wearing only light clothes because the atmosphere will be so warm that you can't afford to wear thick or heavy clothes. Now, let us see what we can do about this. Let's look at activities that increase carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. So if we know that doing A, B, and C will cause these gases to increase in the atmosphere they will try as much as possible to prevent doing those things so that we don't have a lot of the gases in the atmosphere one burning of fossil fuels that is another thing talking about petrol diesel kerosene as long as we burn these fuels they are going to give us byproducts waste and as part of the that waste, carbon dioxide will be produced and it will go and settle in the atmosphere. So, 
even if you are used to so much of burning, burning items with kerosene, we would advise that you look at ways and means to prevent that as much as possible. If whatever you want to burn is biodegradable, if it can get rotten and be part of the soil, then it will be better we dig deep, put those materials there that can get rotten, then we cover, and then with time, they become part of the soil. These are we just burning. Then, the next thing that can increase the levels of carbon dioxide is deforestation. That is the cutting down of trees. So it is very good that we try and plant more trees. Why? Because plants will absorb the carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. When they are trying to prepare their own food, they will need part of that carbon dioxide to do it. So if it is in the atmosphere, they try to absorb it. They take it. So we have to plant more trees around your home, around your schools, so that they help to reduce the content of carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. If we do the reverse, if we cut down trees indiscriminately and we don't plant back, then we are heading for trouble. You realize that you, the, the, there will be less or few trees to absorb the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and we will be experiencing global warming because the carbon dioxide will trap heat from the earth and make maintain it on the surface of the earth. So these gases, which are the greenhouse gases, they in effect act like an insulating blanket around the earth. So they keep the, the, the sun's rays or the heat from the earth from escaping, which is not good for us on the earth. So, when there is global warming, what is the effect? What is the consequence? Why should we take this seriously? Now, global warming melts ice at the poles. So, there are places where it's not just raining, snow falls, ice falls, and the heat it heaps up at a place. It forms a huge mountain like an iceberg. It is all around the place. It's like you putting water in your freezer. With time, it becomes hardened, it becomes ice, and it's there. So when you try to put up the freezer, what happens to the ice? It begins to melt because in that case, the cooling has been stopped and the compartment of the freezer is becoming warmer. So once it's becoming warmer, the ice begins to melt. So in the same way, where you have ice deposited, when there is global warming, gradually the ice begins to melt. When the ice melts, it becomes what? Water. And the water will flow to find it, its way somewhere. Now, there are some animals that live in the ice. That is where they stay. They need that very cold environment or very cold temperature to survive. So when it happens that the ice begins to melt, then there's trouble. The place becomes warm for them. And life will become uncomfortable for animals like the polar bears, the seals that live in ice. So let us try and be kind to those animals too by preventing global warming. Now, as the ice melts from the poles, it becomes water. The water will flow and it enters the sea. So it's like you have a cup of water, maybe half full, and you keep, you put, let's say, ice in the cup of water. With time, the ice will melt. And when it melts, you are likely that after melting, the level of water in the cup should increase because the ice will melt and add up to the water. So in the same way, when the ice melts from the poles and enters the sea, it will cause the sea to rise. That means the water level in the sea will come higher. Will come higher. If it is too much, it means that the sea will now overflow its boundaries 
and claim land that is meant for human settlement. So the land that you are supposed to live on comfortably because the ice has melted from the poles and has entered the sea, the sea has risen, it's now going beyond its boundaries. So then it will start coming into people's homes or those who have their houses close to the sea. The water level will rise and then start coming there. Come to come to claim the land that is meant for human settlement. So these are some of the effects of global warming. We can also look at another thing. There are some fishes that want a particular kind of temperature environment to stay. So if it happens that the globe is becoming warmer and they feel warmer at where they are, then they will keep moving deeper into the water. So it will cause these fishes to migrate to deeper and cooler levels of the sea. Now, fishermen will then have to travel deeper, 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 long distances to be able to get a catch. And this can reduce the catch of fishermen. So as we think through, as we look at global warming, let's think about the fish that almost every day you take for your meal. If it happens that the fish decide to migrate and go away into deeper levels of the water or of the sea, the fishermen might complain that they are not able to get enough catch. If it's not enough and the demand is high too, it means the price of the fish will go higher. And then not everyone might be able or may be able to afford. And that might be a problem for all of us. So we do our best to play our part so that we prevent global warming. I believe that by now, you should have come to terms with what I have presented, all that I've presented, started by looking at energy, which is the ability to do work. Then we looked at the sources of energy. We said we are renewable, we have non renewable sources. There are sources that naturally they are being replaced with time, they are being replaced within a short time so they don't get into extinction they don't get finished so we say they are renewable sources of energy then there are others that do not get replaced with time so with time they get finished and some too the rate at which they are being replaced with time is so slow so the demand outweighs the rate at which they are being produced so they get finished with time they are non-renewable sources of energy. So if I, I'm, I, I are given some sources of energy and you're asked to group them into renewable and non-renewable sources, you should be able to do that. Then we look at the forms of energy where we can push them into two main headings, kinetic and then potential. And we looked at a number of them. Then we went ahead to look at greenhouse effects. What greenhouse effect is, what greenhouse gases are, what global warming is, and the effect of global warming on life on this earth. It's time for us to try and see whether we got a very good understanding of the concept. So, for our first question under tutorial one, I'm saying explain the following briefly, briefly, greenhouse effect. So you're asked to explain briefly greenhouse effect. Then you go ahead to and explain global warming. Don't mix the two. Greenhouse effect, the activity of greenhouse gases, trapping harmful rays, radiations that are supposed to leave the Earth's surface. That is greenhouse effect. Global warming is the rise in the temperature of the Earth's surface. Due to the activity of the greenhouse gases, 
that behave like a blanket or an insulating material, preventing radiation from leaving the Earth's surface. So that is it for greenhouse effects and then global warming. They are saying give two ways by which greenhouse effects could be reduced. So we know that it is a greenhouse gases that cause greenhouse effect. So whatever we do to reduce the production of these greenhouse gases will indirectly or directly reduce greenhouse effect. So ask yourself, what do we do to stop too much carbon dioxide being staying in the atmosphere? What do we do with these fumes from exhaust of vehicles moving into the atmosphere? What do we do with indiscriminate burning here and there, giving out harmful gases that stay in the atmosphere? You can discuss this with a friend and read more from the internet and see what you can do as an individual on your own. Play your part so that you save the world. Then, the last question I would like to, you to look at is what is the difference between biomass and biogas? What is the difference between biomass and biogas? They are not the same. One talks about materials such as dead plants, dead animals, waste from plants, animals like cow dung. You can even have sawdust that are put together. That's the material, biomass. Then the gas that is produced out of the biomass. When these materials ferment and then they give off a gas, that gas is what you call the biogas. There are schools that have been able to harness the biogas for use at their kitchen to prepare food for students. And that is a very good thing that you can even try to do at home. At home. So that whatever waste that is biodegradable, that can get rotten, that you, do, you, you create at home, to try to channel it to getting biogas. So that we use that instead of just going to buy LPG, which is liquefied petroleum gas, to cook. We could use that one to, to cook. I believe you've enjoyed the lesson. These are practical things that we have to do for ourselves and for our world. I hope to come your way another time with another interesting lesson on energy. Till then, my name again is Anne Pabi Albert. You can call me Pius. Keep doing what you have been doing and be consistent. And I believe that you are going to achieve your aims. All the best. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.